Uh, my name is Derek Davis. I'm a sculptor, um, fabricator, and uh, a teaching artist at Creative Arts Workshop. Um, I also run my own business called um, EJ Davis Aesthetics. We make uh, custom fabrication for uh, commercial clients and residential clients. A lot of it is furniture. Um, we've been doing custom installations for commercial projects everywhere from New York City to Boston. Um, sometimes we go out of town even further, but not, not often. Um, some of our clients for furniture go all the way from uh, California up to Maine. So uh, we do a lot of different things. Lately, we've been doing um, public sculptures, uh, most recently in New Haven. In the Dixwell area, we did the I Matter Towers, uh, three illuminated towers that are uh, basically at an intersection in the Dixwell neighborhood, helped change the community there. We're really, really proud of that. And then recently um, at the University of New Haven, we did a large aluminum piece that just went in um, outside of their new um, Bergami building that's being uh, finished off right now. So um, to get things started, I'm gonna start in my office, kind of give you an idea of my process of how I start um, a project and what we normally do in here in terms of the thinking part. Um, feel free to you know, kind of ask questions and chime in. Um, right over here is my desk, a little standing desk. I get a lot of my work done here. Um, and uh, at this point, this is where I do my project management, uh, talking to clients, you know, virtually and especially virtually now, and then via email and all the other correspondence, the design work, everything that I do on the computer here. Um, this is my, my vision board or my, you know, my crazy board. So when things spin around, I got to put them somewhere, they go there. Um, and then hopefully from here, they end up on the calendar, which means work is getting done. So this is my month calendar. This is how I kind of keep things organized for the month at hand. Um, right now, it's kind of, I fill in it with, okay, I got to keep myself moving and, um, you know, lots of ideas and, and, and ways to connect with people, ways to kind of come up with something new when, when things are a little bit slow. Um, we get our basic office printer, we get our files. The office is, you know, complete without a coffee maker. Um, we do have a fridge. It works. There's stuff in it uh, for lunch most of the time. Uh, this is the water cooler where I talk to myself mostly. Um, don't really have a whole lot of water cooler buddies. Sometimes when Travis is here, we talk. Um, just going to kind of wheel you around a little bit. This is um, this is the Officially the pantry. Uh, this is that's the escape door, in case in case we need to get out of here in a hurry. Um, entertainment center, which is never on unless we're watching cartoons. Right, Cole? <laughs> and, um, and then around this way, uh, the only access to the outside world is this tiny little window. Um, this is where I do all my thinking. In the thinking chair, it gets a fair amount of use. Um, my jungle, which is, you know, well-maintained. Um, and then, you know, books and knickknacks and little pieces of art that, you know, I, I like to hang around in my space. It makes me think, and, um, kind of feels a little homey in here. So uh, this is really where my brain goes to get stuff done. So from here, we'll, uh, oh wait, this is the big calendar. This is where, this is where the year gets figured out. Um, it's never full. It's really especially not full right now, uh, you know. Um, and then this is more of my um, sort of another vision board, but this is for like bigger thoughts and things where I have to kind of sit and think about an idea and I can, you know, really hash a lot of it out, write it down and make sure that I don't lose it because it doesn't stay up there very long. It just tends to disappear when all the other stuff comes through. And I'll take you out into the workshop. Sorry for the bumpy ride, but the best I got right now. Aaron, um, do, you, uh, do you dream at night and do you write? What, what do you do in the middle of the night when you get one of these, uh, you know, lightning strikes? I usually try to write things down. If I'm really compelled, I'll get up and I'll write it down. Um, sometimes, uh, well, I know when I don't get up to write it down, it doesn't make it to the morning. But um, yeah. sometimes when I, um, when I really have something that I need to kind of keep an eye on, I, I'll, I'll keep a pad close by or I'll even run to get one just to make sure I don't, I don't lose it. 
Um, all right, so onward coming out of the uh, office. You know, that's necessary. We have one of those here, so that's good. Bathroom. Um, I'll give you kind of a quick pan around the whole shop and then we'll kind of go section to section so you guys get an idea what we're, what we're up against here. Um, basically, we kind of start out here and give a little turnaround. This is one, one corner outside the workshop and then as we move around, you get an idea of the whole space, um, tools and tables and more tools, and shelving mostly, kind of keep everything, try to keep it nice and organized. Um, I really learned the hard way many times that if you don't stay organized, you're wasting a lot, a lot, a lot of time. Um, and we want to keep doing what we're doing. We don't want to waste time. All right, so we'll start over here. Can you all hear me fine? Yes? Okay, good. So over here, basically, um, this is where we keep things like gloves and respirators, things we're going to toss on and off. Because um, right now, washing hands in the bathroom is pretty important. So um, lots of on and off stuff, tool bags, um, kind of some odds and ends, you know, things that we don't use a lot. Get stuff down the bottom, some chisels and things for carving stone. We don't do that as much as we used to. Um, let's see what else. Let's get a little closer. Over here we have our flammable cabinet. This is where we put paint, um, spray paint, solvents, cleaners. The real nasty stuff goes in here. Uh, stuff you don't really want to be breathing in all the time. Things that if it catches on fire, it would be bad for you. So it stays in there. Um, keep it safe. Up here is uh, patinas for working with metal. So when we do a lot of metal work that requires a specialty finish, like we're going to rust something up, um, that's the patina work. The patinas go up there um, and all the related chemicals that go with that. Um, over here, this is more paint stuff. So this is real industrial paint, uh, wood stain, adhesives, wood finish painting supplies, um, anything that we're going to put on like a piece of furniture or uh, you know, a, a, like a, a more durable finish, that's, that's where all that stuff is. And then over here is kind of a, kind of a mishmash shelf, uh, specialty tools, um, we got staplers, we got little wood screws, anything we're going to use to fasten wood together down here and then uh, masonry anchors for putting stuff into the ground. Um, not the heavy duty stuff, just the, you know, the things that we're going to put a tap on in the floor and, and anchor a piece of um, steel on the ground goes right there. Um, let's see, we'll get you around further. Anybody wants to see anything close up, let me know, I can zoom you in. Um, over here is, let's see, right now. Yeah, all right. Over here is a little bit more where we have our hand tools. We got, you know, a skill saw, a best tool, track saw, a nail guns, planers, power hammers, all this little stuff, little um, a masonry hammer. This is where we keep all of our hand tools, like wrenches, and we have screwdrivers. Uh, all that other stuff, pliers, goes in there. We keep our drills and drill bits over here to make sure that it's all in the same place every time. I, they always end up on a different table when things are busy, so I always like to put it back when we're done. This whole thing is just sandpaper. Um, moving along this way, we got into, um, we get into kind of where we're, our little fasteners go, everything that we put stuff together with. So screws, like machine screws, nuts and bolts. It's all here, it's all organized. We, um, this last year, uh, unfortunately, the, the geezer company in Derby uh, shut their doors and they had an auction um, to pick up you know, their odds and ends. And so we basically just grabbed everything from organizing. It used to be just piles of stuff, and like little bits and pieces here, and, it was just really inefficient to find things and it just used to drive me nuts. So I spent a lot of time and energy um, 
making sure that everything is where it is. This is all a sort of an upgrade from, from where it was, but everything from a number eight, you know, met machine screw all the way up to um, like a two inch bolt. Um, and then we have rigging and all that other stuff, bigger drills, air compressors, uh, air compression uh, fittings and tools. Further down is more like epoxy. Uh, and we have abrasive wheels. So I'll get you a little closer. Give you a little bit better view of what it is. So these are all like little bins. Pull it out. Got stuff in. And um, it goes right back where you found it. Because if it doesn't, then I can't find it. And, you know. Um, like I said, uh, epoxy is more like industrial strength adhesive. Um, my, my new favorite thing is Bonda. So when you really don't want to fix something, but you want it to look like you fixed it, Bonda. Um, it's got some random sort of material things. You got a whole pile of leftover brass and bronze. Someday maybe we'll melt it and turn it into something special. Um, but right now it's being kind of stored. Uh, over here we have the abrasive wheels, everything from these little mini mini discs that go on a tiny right angle grinder to these big guys. And that's for like a burnishing tool and that's gonna um, basically directionally polish uh, stainless steel or metal or anything like that. Um, so around the way here, we'll keep moving. We have, this is where we kind of get a little bit more of the work, work done. Um, on this side, we have a, a basically, which is which amount, what amounts to like a, a temporary chop saw station. We take that thing kind of everywhere. Uh, if we go to a job site where we need to kind of cut things up and, and fit things together on site, it comes with us. Um, a lot of places that are like mill shops, um, I do a lot of straight carpentry. We'll have a, a stationary one and a stationary um, table saw and all this other stuff. We do so many different things that we're always moving things around. We're always taking something from one place to another. That saw could be set up at any point in this shop if we have a lot of stuff that we want to do or if we, you know, we're cutting long lengths of things. Everything we're doing here is flexible and modular because never are we doing the same thing twice. Never. Um, if we do, we probably send it somewhere else so that they can do it for us because we want to do the fun, cool stuff that you know everybody, everybody likes to see. Um, further on down, we have um, just sort of our cordless tools, um, stuff that ends up on the job site. You know, grinders, little bit, of, little hand saws, uh, things that are going to be doing the refined work when we get out in the field. We don't have electricity plugs or we don't really want to worry about that. Um, that's the stuff we grab. Um, down there is the lathe. We're going to get a little bit more into more of the metal work stuff here. Uh, that's for when we do kind of we want to do like a really special hinge or we want to make something big perfectly fit into a, a tube or something like that. We spin it on the lathe and we shape it down to exactly the right dimension so so that it fits and we can use it. Um, and then as we go further we get a little bit more into real metal work. Um, so you'll see on this side, we have lots and lots of clamps. We got lots of clamps. If anybody tells you you don't have enough clamps or you have too many clamps, they don't know what they're doing. You need as many clamps as possible, always clamps. Um, so these are our big long bar clamps. We use those a lot when we're doing like a big table and want to kind of make sure everything fits perfectly so we force it into shape and then we stick it together. Um, oxyacetylene torches for when we're cutting and bending stuff so we heat stuff up and um, makes it easier to bend, twist, whatever. Um, a lot of it we do when we do a blacksmithing uh, uh, project where we have to do something really detailed, we get into that. Um, and then cutting, some of the sculptures are straight cutting with metal. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of cool stuff we can do with the torches. Uh, hopefully, we get to kind of teach a class with a little bit of that in it at some point. That'd be fun. Um, one of the things that also we 
we get to deal with with the um, with the blacksmithing is these is the anvil. So we have the anvil here. Um, this guy has been with me from the get go. So this anvil is kind of where I started. Nice and neat. We've got about a million hammers, um, more vice grips. All of our pneumatic tools are here. So we just anytime we need something that um, something that's going to work specifically for a project, we have like you know, little right angle grinders. This guy will take a burr out, spins around real fast, it does shaping, whether it's wood or metal or epoxy or anything, it just gets the work done quickly. Um, we use this guy a lot, this is a palm sander. Um, we use Cole's favorite tool. This is a cleanup tool, the blue blower. Yeah, right buddy? And, uh, and all the stuff we need that runs on pneumatics, we kind of keep right there. Um, as we go along a little bit more, we'll get into more specific hand tools, so right angle grinders, um, all the wheels that go with those, more sanders. This is the belt sander right here, this guy. That's the, that's the one you don't want to put your face on or anything on. It really does, it's aggressive. So we don't, we don't, we don't try to put our hands near that. Um, this is a sort of the workhorse drill press that we use. Um, we don't do a lot of drilling, but when we have specific stuff that we need to do, you know, it, it, it happens. A lot of times we punch things. We have a, a, a an air powered press that'll just punch a hole in something. Um, so we, if we can get away with it, we'll use that first because it's just easier to use. And then over here we have more of the actual metal equipment, the welding equipment. So. Um, Air compressor, said air compressor that runs all those pneumatic tools. Another drill press. This is sort of a workstation, um, sort of a setup for when we're drilling things on the drill press. We put our parts here. Measuring tools on this wall. Welders. All we have three different kinds. Um, we have this little guy, which is our travel welder. Um, it's a little Miller Passport. I've had that. I guess ten years almost now. Um, this guy's. A little bigger, gets most of the heavy duty work done. We don't want to do anything thicker. It's, uh, we can produce a lot more, a lot quicker, so we're not really waiting uh, for it to kind of recycle. Whereas we can't weld as long with this guy, it's going to kind of burn itself out. And then we have a really small TIG welder. Um, the TIG welder is really good for not making a mess, but it takes a lot longer to set up. So, you know, when we're doing really small, skinny stuff, we don't do a lot of super fine things. Um, but when we do, we don't want to make spatter or make a mess. We use that um, tape welder to to make a nice weld. And then the really fun part, it's all really fun, but this guy, if you can see it, this is a power hammer that basically spins and goes up and down like this. And smashes metal in between this space. It's like a 25 pound sledgehammer that can go five beats per second. Wham, 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 wham. So whenever we're dealing with um, hot metal or trying to draw something out and blacksmithing comes to a point, it's thick, we use that and it's quick and fun and can be dangerous, but it's better than um, doing two hours at a time, you know, that something could take five minutes, so it's great. And then um, from down with that, we use the forges. So let's see, I'll get a little closer. So I built these two forges, this little guy here. Um, I built in a garage two houses ago. And then this guy I built in my workshop in Hamden a few years ago, so that's for doing longer things, big scrolls, things that are, um, you gotta put in there a couple times. One time we did a scroll that took 19 feet of straight steel and turned it into a squiggle that's about that tall. So, um, so that's great for that type of thing. Um, this little guy's great for making like 
uh, hand size things, um, bottle openers I do a lot of. So that's also the, the thing I take portably to do a little workshop. Um, I guess it was last year I did a birthday party, um, brought the anvil and a, um, and a little um, leg vise and that which is a regular propane um, thing that you would use on your grill and taught kids how to make, we were making, I guess, uh, marshmallow skewers, really low key, something that wasn't gonna hurt anybody, but um, that was a good time. And then this is, um, this is my bigger bandsaw, so if we're gonna cut bits of, um, heavy bits of metal, you just kinda set it and forget it, it goes down on its own and, and cuts the metal that way. Um, so this way, you can see the table on the right. Most of the big fabrication stuff we do is um, is done on this on these two tables. These are each five foot by five foot, three quarter inch thick um, steel tables. Um, and then there's another one here that's another uh, an older holdover from my working in the garage days that we kept. It was really helpful to do um, that big sculpture from at UNH with something so big. It's a happy man. Cole likes the happy man. Um, that's sort of a leftover of, a, of another project that I think has been out in New Haven in a couple of places. Um, this rack over here is um, storage and multi-use. So, you know, down below we have just like cutoffs and blocking. So whenever we're going to kind of fit little pieces together, want to hold things in place, we have a lot of blocking. If we want to raise something up a little bit while we're putting it together, um, we use that. This is all reclaimed wood, a lot of it from, um, from the house. These are sort of specialty things. So we have everything from, uh, you know, leftover chainsaw stuff. This will this will hurt you. So careful. Um, I know. And um, jumper cables, extra air hoses, wheels, feet for furniture, electrical supplies, straps. Another thing you can never have too many of straps. And then dimensional lumber. So one by two by anything we're going to build with, we'll put up there for a big project. Um, it can get full and uh, and I've never actually seen it empty because we always get more than we need. Um, but that's also good for the next job. And then up above, um, you know, like epoxies, every random thing you can think of, different kinds of um, oil paints, old art supplies, really old stuff goes up there that I haven't touched in years. So, you know, we keep it in case we want to get back to it. Um, like at times like this, when everything's really slow. But I find myself being occupied anyway. Uh, over here is steel, dimensional steel. So this is everything from, at the bottom is like I-beams, really, really thick stuff. Um, this is a big giant piece of aluminum tube um, that we use for the iMatter project. This is the center post for that, so that's a big leftover that we'll have to make something cool out of. Um, angle iron flat bar, tubes, and then smaller skinny stuff as we go up um, for, for little bits and pieces of projects. You can see, as you can see, there's a forklift over here. Everybody should have a forklift. So great. It's the best. Um, we really wouldn't be able to do any of the cool big stuff if we didn't have a forklift. Um, yeah, so that's necessary. Uh, on this side, we are more sort of organizational stuff. As you can see, it's really clean in here, so we had a lot of time to pair. Um, the back end is just kind of cutoffs, little little scrap pieces that will, um, sometimes they'll make it into bigger pieces. A lot of time we use that for metal blocking, so when we want to pick something up off the table for clamping, we'll use smaller metal pieces. That's great for that. Um, some of that stuff turns into, you know, furniture and knickknacks too, whenever we need it. And then the back there we have, uh, there, that's the, um, sheet metal. So sheets of 
steel, sheets of aluminum. Um, we also have like plywood, acrylic sheets, Azac, anything that's like a sheet product, we put in the big rack up there. It all stands up. We keep it nice and neat. Um, that's also an upgrade that we had this year that needed to be done. It was just an explosion before and just not, um, not manageable. Um, this is a tabletop I'm working for, uh, for a friend of mine, Brent, that some of you know. Um, he's, he's seen some of it, but we're gonna try to keep it secret. Um, this is all storage for things, you know, that come and go. So we have uh, moving blankets, tarps. Um, over here we have um, ram boards. So like when we go to a, you know, somebody's fancy house, that stuff goes on the floor so we don't mar up the ground. Um, you know, horses, chainsaw, when we gotta do, um, sometimes we cut a tree down here and there and mill it. So there's a log mill back there um, that produces that stuff up there. So, so we'll mill slabs and let them kind of dry out or we'll make a piece of furniture out of it. Um, these are all, uh, the ones on the top are stuff that I milled um, from a tree in the yard. And then these beams are, um, are actually chestnut also from the house. So I'm trying to find a, a, a buyer for those. Those are pretty valuable actually. And then um, kind of it. There's always some kind of random stuff hanging around. So like it, th this, this is a mold actually that, that I, was, that I had fixed and um, for another artist who immediately needed it a year ago. So it's still here and um, you know, you know who you are, come get it. Come and get it, not on the phone, I'll, it's time. So sometimes we have, we have leftovers of things like that that kind of make their way uh, into the, the permanent part of the shop. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the overview. And uh, yeah, um, like I said, this whole space right now is super clean and organized. It's been, um, it was a really busy first part of the year. Um, I think I have a couple of pictures I could share, give you an idea of how busy it was. So I'm just gonna share the screen for a minute and see, so you guys can see what's going on. Let's see. Y'all can see it? See me screening through? Okay. So this is the beginning of the, um, of that sculpture that went into New Haven uh, at the University of New Haven. Um, smaller piece that was part of that, kind of get the idea. So this is us using the, the bigger tables, you know, in a way that makes this thing come to life. This is, um, Another project that we did at the same time as that big sculpture that went down at the drive um, workspace, the new renovation down there in New Haven. Um, more sculpture applications. You get an idea of how we might use the clamps there. Um, so some things hold the other together while we're welding so we don't go out of place. Um, this is more of the finished product of those welds. So my main man, Travis, I wish, I don't know if he's on this call, but this guy is more valuable than gold to me. He does so much work and he's really, really talented and he's a super nice guy. So great to have um, people like that around a lot. I don't know who that is, but they're welding. Um, more of that drive workspace. This is that sculpture in the shop. So you give you an idea of, of the scale of the things that we work on here. Um, it took up those two projects. So, this one and that one were going on at the same time. We had just finished um, this project when we were getting ready to, to move forward to get into the um, this other sculpture project. This is the interior of the, um, of the iMatter towers. So we designed this to hold all the illuminated lights. This is another table project to give you an idea of how much um, not clean the space could get. Um, more kind of pictures from the eye matter. This is, um, this is a sculpture that's outside of the creative arts workshop, me um, torching it and um, 
in the background, you kind of see there's hoses and ropes and things going on. You can't really see straight. Um, this is a TIG welding project we did on stainless. More of that. This is the this is me in my high socks. Um, this is the iMatter project just before we were finished. So we were mounting the, the images on the actual on the actual structure here, and this is all um, uh, sign grade acrylic that we lit up from the inside. More sculpture. Um, this is a project we did for for an office space or for a restaurant down in Greenwich. Um, so we took over half the shop basically making this custom cabinet. Um, not something we like to do, but we got the project and so we, we took it. Um, there's the in interior towers, interior of the towers, three of them. This was a cool blacksmithing project for some, uh, for, for a woman locally. Really um, kind of fun, intricate, all torch work, all done by hand, where we bend up the metal and, and shape it, more I matter. So my buddy Sean, um, who's, I don't know if he's on this call or not, but um, he helped uh, one day with the torch. And this is our setup for making sure that it followed the stair um, properly. So we had to build the stairs ahead of time in the shop and then get it to all line up. All the stuff that goes on in between, um, you know, the idea and the, um, and the finished product. As you can see in the background, there were three other projects going on at the same time. Um, so every now and then we'll get so buried that, you know, we just kind of throw stuff everywhere and, uh, and it becomes, uh, becomes a war zone, really. More of that stuff. These are finished products, that, um, table, uh, benches that we painted here. Um, we did the seat tops here, but my friend Justin, um, Justin Hawker of Hawker Metalworks, um, he, this is his design, so he, he did the fabrication. We just... We took his stuff and we finished it off here. So sometimes we'll work with people that way where, you know, we get, we like something that, or we can work with another vendor and then kind of do the finished work here. So we can get a lot more done that way. Uh, maybe some of you have seen this, it's actually not being illuminated, but it's on, it's on Howe Street. Um, that's all solid aluminum that was water jet cut. And we just finished it off here and welded it. This is the iMatter towers that are on the Dixwell, in the Dixwell area. Um, that's what they look like almost finished. I think that's kind of it. So um, stop sharing and get back to talking. So um, yeah, that's, that was like this year's work. So the last year's work. So that's kind of what we, that's where we're moving. A, I'm looking at your website, Eric. You've got some beautiful pieces there also, uh, you. which you should, uh, Give people that information. Yep, we'll post it. If you, Robin, if you want to post the website in the chat, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, so yeah, does anybody um, have any questions? And wanna, any questions coming out of the chat? Uh, yeah, we've got one from Lisa. She says, Eric, for the very large metal sculptures that are geometric, do you make small scale models first? Um, that particular one, there was a small scale model made by the architect. Um, the architect that I work with was um, uh, Marissa Mead. That was her design, and she works for Spiegel's. Um, she developed that herself first, and then basically gave us a rendering, computer rendering, with dimensions. And we took it from the rendering stage and calculated how it was going to work with the material. So we made it thicker. Um, made sure the joints fit all right, so we had to make actual adjustments to the file itself before we took the rendering and then made the little bits and pieces out of it and sent that out to get a uh, water jet cut. So sometimes we do get to do a scale model, but sometimes we don't. It depends on the project, um, really. It depends on... So for that case, specifically, the architect had done all of the had done all the research work, had done all the design work, and we just were fabricating and installing or, or coordinating with the install. So some of it was, um, you know, they, they, they did all that stuff. So for something like the iMatter project, which was, we designed it, um, I did all of that on the computer. So I work in SketchUp mostly, 
And that was all done with math on the computer. And then we went from there to get that part, all the parts that needed to get, get you know, cut out, sent that part out, got the pieces back, and then just assembled. So we're mostly just set up to assemble. If we're gonna do something that's, um, you know, that requires a big machine or a specialty process, we don't want the overhead for all that equipment. So we work a lot with, um, a lot with industry partners to, to put things together. Um, it's a lot easier to do a lot more when we're working with the relationships rather than trying to do it all ourselves. Um, also learned that the hard way. It's really, really time consuming to try to get that done by hand. Um, and then something like the, um, the Being Illuminated sculpture, which was at Citywide Open Studios, the, the Happy Man. So that was also something that we designed on the computer. Um, so, you know, but we, but we built it all here from scratch. So we've got another one for you, Eric. Um, what is your process for determining scope and cost of a project? How small or large are the ranges of your projects? Um, so scope usually comes to us from whoever we're being commissioned by. So for, um, sometimes we'll get, you know, more of the decorative part of a bigger project. For example, that the, the larger sculpture that went out at the University of New Haven was a really small spot part of that larger project. Uh, and then come for, and sometimes we'll get like a railing for a larger build out. Most of the time we're doing sort of the specialty thing. Um, so the scope tends to come from the people who are making the request. Um, and determining the scale also comes with that. The cost really just is all about um, trying to work out the math in your head, in my head and on a spreadsheet. So I, I spend a lot of time doing spreadsheets, which most artists probably don't like to do, and I don't even like to do it. Um, but to run a business, you kind of have to know where the numbers are. And so, you know, you go, you start at what is it made out of? Um, how are we going to process it? And then um, how much do we need? You know, how many times do we have to do any certain thing? Who are we going to hire to, um, to get it produced? Are we going to do it here ourselves? So you kind of have to think about how it's going to get done before you give somebody um, a price. And almost, I mean, I get, I'm getting a whole lot better at it than I used to be. Originally, um, I would never make money uh, at it because I just underestimated how much time it would take um, and also didn't, um, didn't spend a lot of time and energy developing relationships with partners who could do it for me. So again, a big learning. Um, I think that answered the question. Um, the smaller pieces, the range goes from, we used to do, I used to do, we used to just be me, I would do a one-off of anything and, um, and I would, you know, just try to get as many little projects as I could. Um, I don't do really little projects anymore unless they're special, like unless it's something that I really believe in and I think like somebody else is going to find beautiful and it's going to, make the world a better place. Maybe I'll do something real small um, because it has a, maybe has a bigger meaning to other people. Um, but we're, we're really trying to push more toward doing things that a lot of people will see and it has um, content to it that, you know, is valuable to the communities that it's, um, that, that are being engaged where it is. So the I Matter project is specifically one of the more important ones that we did. Anytime I do something at Citywide Open Studios, it's really to, to kind of get people to think and you know make make an impact and um, yeah that that's it the the, the price ranges from um, I don't I don't I, I don't want to really get into them <laughs> yeah I don't remember but um, we do small that, stuff and big stuff that might segue into a question that I had for you Eric um, you're speaking of your studio team as we. Um, so how big is your team and uh, like, how did you make those connections and are they all New Haven based or? Yeah. Um, so the we um, is me, myself and I and Travis, who I mentioned before, he's here most of the time right now, obviously we're distancing and there's not enough work to keep anybody um, engaged um, over time and, and in certain projects. 
I'll bring in other folks like Josh. Um, and in the past, I've worked with a guy named Mike Skaggs and um, Sean Blashley, super talented. All of them really like good guys and talented in, in their own way. Um, you know, the workflow and the workload doesn't always necessitate a huge team. Um, and I don't, right now, we want to kind of pay attention to um, the kind of quality that we're putting out rather than being so busy that, you know, and trying to grow too fast where, where we kind of suffer our, you know, sanity and that we're moving too fast. We don't have time to kind of spend on doing the work because I still get engaged in doing the work, um, which may or may not need to change at some point, depending on how the economy changes um, in the next couple months to a year. Um, right. But I like to keep it kind of small because the communication gap is important when we're doing really kind of refined and things that we've never done before. So it's really easy to kind of say, and I even do this with Travis, we know we kind of know what each other is going to do. Um, but there'll be times where I say something, you know, and he's doing this part of it and he assumes one thing and I'm assuming another thing. And it's just like, okay, I need to be much more clear as, as a, as a leader in what exactly that I want um, without being a jerk too. Cause you know, sometimes it's like, you don't, you don't want to like, you don't want to assume, but you don't want to offend either. So. Yeah. We have a few more that came in. Um, were you ever a student of CAW and what got you started in blacksmithing? Um, my first foray into metalwork was with Ann Lehman, um, way, way back before I even started my business. Um, so yes, I was a student. I took, I think I took her metal sculpture class and then kind of, kind of went off on my own and learning. Um, went to welding school, went, got a job as a welder um navigated you know pitfalls of running my own business um what was the second part of that question uh well you kind of answered it what got you started in blacksmithing probably okay. some more answer the blacksmithing however was something that uh a leftover from uh, a sort of an ambition that i had to um to run a foundry so i, I always wanted to pour metal and blacksmithing was something that I figured I needed to make my own tools for like the tongs and the, and the various, you know, different things that you would need to run a, uh, a foundry. So building the furnaces and the forges was also part of that, um, that ambition to build a foundry. I never got to the foundry part, but you know, it's never too late, right? Eric, good morning. <laughs> hey, how are you, Kathleen? Good. Um, did you ever intend this or did you intend this to be um art projects um as much as they are versus more practical solutions for people who need welding or blacksmithing done has it always been more of a and do you enjoy the artist part of it more yeah it was um definitely intentional to be more creatively based um not just art projects but you know the custom furniture thing is more of a holdover from a practical side of things and the custom met, uh, fabrication is, is sort of to make money so that I can do the art projects. And, okay. and really this last two years, uh-oh, what happened? I'm here. Okay, my Zoom screen changed, hold on. There it is. The last two years, um, the last two years have been really more focused on super creative, getting more towards a public sculpture because that's been the ambition to grow toward that. Um, when I started out, I was fixing dump trucks and lawn mowers and doing all the crap that, no, that I didn't want to do, fixing things. Um, you know, uh, little Mr. Mr. Pascarella, I know I see you, buddy, is um, mm -hmm. it, I, I actually bought the business from his dad who, who unfortunately passed away. Um, but he had the same idea, you know, he was interested in doing things more beautifully and taking time in the craft. And he was into the blacksmithing. I have his power hammer still. Um, and so there, there was a lot to, um, you know, there was a lot to build on there that I took and, and sort of kept going with. 
Um, but yeah, I think he was also frustrated and, and so was I with doing, um, doing the type of work that wasn't as rewarding as the creative stuff. And yeah. so it's been a lot of, you know, falling and getting up and trying to navigate that in a way that allows that to grow. So. Yeah, I get that. I get it. So, <laughs> it's nice to walk away and say, oh, I did that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Cole. Hi. <laughs> Your daddy's very smart, you know. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know that. <laughs> smart is debatable, but. <laughs> he is. He takes it to his dad. Hard work. Hard work. <laughs> it's going to go down the generations. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I'm going to turn off my, um, my heat because I can't hear you. Hold on one second. All right, back. We'll in a second. Cole has a question. What's up? Yeah, Cole made that the other day. Cole, I don't know if anybody could see what Cole has, but we, we did our little welding practice the other day. So I saw it. We're getting week. we're getting there. <laughs> Good job, and buddy. A sword, it's a machete. Oh, sorry, machete. <laughs> yeah, you win. <laughs> so Eric, we have um, one more sort of general working artist question for you. How do you balance the art side and the business part of making a living? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, it is. The, the art side is, um, the art side it has been more difficult to, um, to really get totally engrossed in because I'm spending a lot of time trying to manage and organize and, and create the space for other people to do the work. Um, the vision is there, right? The passion to create something beautiful and come up with something new and um, you know, do, do, do work that I could be proud of or that I would be proud of if I was doing it myself. Um, and you know, Earlier in my career, it was very much more about wanting to make art, and that's my thing. And um, as I've kind of, as I've progressed and managed to not um, starve as an artist, I'm thinking it's it's a lot more valuable to kind of pass on the the work and the knowledge and the things that I do know to people who are, you know, at a different point in their in their career. So the teaching part has come back into sort of the view for me and, and engaging with other people and learning. Um, I'm teaching, you know, the guys that I work with a lot, they're teaching me too. Um, but, but the message and the sort of the, the, the passion of an artist and saying what I need to say and being, um, uh, you know, very focused on just that is, is not really to me as important as, um, what other people are going to get out of the end product. So it's just being a part of the project and being a part of the process and leading it as a, as a director, as like a creative person, that's, that's become the most rewarding part for me. Um, you know, I think it's pretty well known that a lot of the more established artists in their careers don't do as much of the work at all. You know, they're just coming up with the concepts and they're, and they're, and they're, they're directing the people who have, you know, the sort of the, the aptitudes and the talent to to execute and, and I could say this for the people that work with me is that you know most of them are better at what they do than I am so I just let them do it and it's and it always comes out better part of that is um, they've been you know they have experience in certain building you know techniques and stuff like that um, that I didn't really I didn't have and then the other part is you know I don't have I don't have all my digits and so my, you know, my skill level isn't what it used to be um, before, before I got injured. So, so it's really more about um, the artist coming out through the work and the process and, and then leading through that. Great. Well, I think we'll, um, unless you have anything else, Robin, if you have anything else, I think we'll wrap up. Um, just for myself, this has been a real treat to see. You've got quite the setup, so. Um, and, uh, it's pretty great how organized it is now. Um, yeah, I'm hoping to keep it that way, but not yeah. for the wrong reasons. Right. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, I just want to invite everyone to kind of, as much as you can, do the poll. Um, we'd love to get the feedback. Um, kind of want to make an announcement. That I'm going to be doing an online um, community discussion next Friday at 11. So we're going to talk about inspiration um, in, that, in that talk. Uh, it's, I think it's the same channel, right? Same Zoom number. Um, but there'll be information going out through Creative Arts Workshop. Um, we'll do one and we'll see where it goes. Hopefully there's more to come, but, um, but the idea is to kind of have more of this kind of conversation about um, creativity, what it means to be an artist, um, what it means to just be creative in general.